So there's Our Lady also of Fatima is telling us how so many souls are falling into hell like snowflakes. And so we've got so many people in the world that are going into hell. So there's an urgent call that we care about our neighbor because we're a human family. And so in my personal daily holy hours, there's usually a conversation I have with God about how urgent things are and how I beg him that I can get it, that I can get the message that he wants me to know from him and into my heart and that he uses me as his priest to help stop sinners falling into hell like snowflakes. Here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. We call these special editions The Way is Love. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. The human face is a window into a person's life. Our face, the face we present to the world, and the faces of people we know and see around us are a focal point to our humanity. An expression, a smile, a frown, or even the most subtle muscle move can reveal so much about a person. Our face tells the world who we are, moment to moment. In his recent book, The Secret of the Holy Face, Father Lawrence Carney reveals a detailed account of the three instances Jesus revealed to the world his very face through three separate and distinct miracles which have been the subject of study and fascination ever since. Whether it is the veil of St. Veronica used to wipe the face of Jesus on his walk to Calvary, or the imprint left on the Shroud of Turin, or the veil Jesus left in his tomb, now in Manopello, Italy, the very idea that God, through these miracles, left for us an image of himself as the second person of the Holy Trinity is a testament to the life of Christ. Father Carney revives a somewhat lost but very important devotion to the holy face of Jesus in his book, and he provides us with a detailed understanding of the holy face of Jesus. Here to speak about his book is Father Lawrence Carney. And joining me now is Father Lawrence Carney, author of The Secret to the Holy Face. Father Carney, welcome to the Way is Love podcast. Thank you very much, David, for having me. Father Carney, I have to admit, I've just visited the site at uh, Manopello, which is mentioned in the book, and I've previously visited, visited Turin to see the Holy Shroud. And the experience of being in front of these miracles left me awestruck. But can you talk about how you came to write this volume? Yes. When I was living in St. Joseph, Missouri, I was starting a community of men, and I asked the, one of the Benedictines of Mary nuns, what should I write about? I'm going to write a newsletter. And she said, write on the holy face. So she doesn't talk to me very much because she's not allowed to talk. That was Christmas Day, and she had permission to speak to me. So she's a contemplative, and whenever contemplatives say something, when they're not allowed to speak much, it really, we need to really pay attention. So I took her advice, and somebody gave me a book called The Golden Arrow, which are the revelations of Sister Mary St. Peter, and I discovered these revelations resonated very deeply with me. And not only that, one of the three patrons of the Vell of Veronica and the Arch of the Holy Face was St. Martin of Tours, which happens to be November 11th, my birthday. So God started to send me lots of different signals to make this happen. And then I had written a book called Walking the Road to God, and a, a lady in Tulsa read it and contacted me about becoming Catholic. And she became Catholic. There was a miracle that happened in receiving communion. But I asked her, while I was praying for her to have this miracle, that she would work for the League of St. Martin to promote the Holy Face. So what was neat is she contacted 
TAM publishers without me asking her and asked if they would have me invite me to write this book. So there's a lot of providence at work that produced this book that people are able to read now. The volume is um, powerful, and there's a, a real call to action in the book. And you explain in the book that the devotion to the Holy Face goes hand in hand with the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But could you just talk a bit about how these three devotions were once more intricately connected? Yes, so Sister Mary St. Peter, the Carmelite and Tours, who received these revelations was told by Jesus on her heart that never can the sacred heart and the immaculate heart be separated. So that's something that's very much that's important. If we blaspheme God, it's just, it's almost like blaspheming our lady because she's the mother of God. If we blaspheme our lady, then we're also saying very unkind things about the, the mother of God. So these two hearts, which are full of truth and their wills are one, they have to be connected and, and close together. And that's why I also mentioned that the devotion to the sacred heart, which was developed by St. Mary Margaret Alacoque, had a theme that stopped after the kings of France rejected the petitions that Jesus was telling St. Margaret Mary. But that theme continues in Our Lady of Fatima, and it continues in uh, the revelations to Sister Mary St. Peter and Tours, but it also continues in a very little-known revelation called Our Lady of Revelation, which is in Tre Fontaine, Three Fountains in Rome, which Pope Pius XII has, has approved. And that common theme is the golden arrow. The golden arrow was people that are like archers. They're, they're shooting arrows into the heart of God to wound his heart so that mercy will flow out. And that's what we hear about in the Our Lady of Fatima, that the Immaculate Heart is waiting for a triumph, the heart of Jesus, if the kings of France would have followed that, they would have, they would have triumphed over their enemies instead of the devastating French Revolution. And now, today, we have revolution going on in the whole world. Your book speaks a lot about um, the possibility that it's revolutionary men that are being sent right now against our Holy Mother Church. And I'll just read a quote from the book because this devotion to the Holy Face, this call to this devotion, it doesn't require a lot of people, but it requires devoted people. And this is a quote I'll read from the book. Quote, it only takes a few good men to overcome many evil men. Five of yours shall pursue a hundred others, and a hundred of you ten thousand. Your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I will look on you and make you increase. You shall be multiplied, and I will establish my covenant with you. Can you talk about how that quote is connected to the devotion to the Holy Face? Oh, sure, David. So, the fact that when God fights battles, he only engages a few good men to defeat the evil. And that's because he wants, God wants to show his power. Because if we had an army of good men that outnum outnumbered the army of evil men, well, that would look like that would be a human victory. But when we have low numbers and we have very fervent people on the good team, i.e. the Catholics fighting against the revolution that we see today, then people will see, wait a minute, God's fighting this battle and this is really a miracle and it's of God's hand. So I think that's the point. And we have this 
theme repeated over and over in the Old Testament with Gideon and his 300 men. And in King Jeroboam, the grandson of King David, they defeated the enemy that greatly outnumbered the Israelites because King Jeroboam sent the, sing, sent the singing man in the vanguard and they began to chant the, the Psalms of David. His mercy endureth forever. And as they were chanting, the enemy turned itself, turned on itself and they committed civil war. Wow. So that's why these low numbers are important. So a million people, if they sign up and become members of the Arch Confraternity, out of 7 billion people, those are definitely small numbers. It's uh, that exponential math is, uh, is fantastic. And they are, that is a million, a million people on our planet is a very small number compared to the entire population of the planet. And it, does go to show thank you for that explanation because it does go to show how uh, god wants to work through the few who are devoting themselves to um to this devotion you talk about early in the book about what you describe as the four major periods of the church and what it means for catholics living in modern times can you just go through those four four major periods that we've lived through yeah, so the first 500 years or so, the church was very young, and the Holy Spirit was really concentrated. At the Pentecost, we had the apostles were so full of God that miracles were happening all the time. Then we had the next, you know, about 500 years, the church became legalized. It was no longer underground. And... This is where the church started its parochial system, where it started to get organized, and the great basilicas and cathedrals were built in Europe. And then the next 500 years was the missionary. So the Catholic Church expanded outside of Europe into the rest of the world. And then at one point, everyone on the earth just about more or less knew of Jesus Christ. And now we're in that last 500 years where we're no more apostolic, although we ought to be, but we have to be very much Marian. Mm. The evil is such that the pagans today, I call them neo-pagans, they know Christ and they reject him because the pagans of the past did not know Christ, and they accepted him. So it's like that man who was exercised with one demon. He went, the demon went around, and he came back and repossessed the man, and it was seven times worse. And that's where we're living. So in this age, my personal opinion is that we really have to be very close to Our Lady to be able to make it. And that's why the total consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary has been so important. And I noticed that when people make that total consecration, they're more open to this devotion in particular. Mm -hmm. do you, when it comes to that consecration, do you um, would you suggest the St. Louis de Montfort consecration? It's a 33-day consecration, but it is... It does give people, I personally have done that one, and it does give you a, a very full, it gives you the fullness of Our Lady. He, he seems to be able to describe her in ways that uh, if you grew up uh, after 1970, that you maybe wouldn't have that kind of depth of um, understanding of Our Lady and her role in salvation and in the, and in the whole story. Yeah, I think... It's very important because this total consecration connects us in a mystical way. And the spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to us and her slaves, her clients, in a particular way because it's a humble way to go through her to Jesus, to go through her through to, to the Holy Spirit. 
So in order to be guided in this pilgrimage that we live on, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. And when we offer ourselves as slaves, then the Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts in a way that we can understand and hear the Holy Spirit and be led in these revolutionary times. There's, there's kind of an urgency that comes through in your writing. And um, could you just share what you've learned that drives this urgency to call people to begin to practice this devotion? Sure. Yeah, so first of all, particularly, each of us only has a short time that we're living on this earth, and then there's eternity. And the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. The church father said, if we thought about these things in a serious way, we would never commit mortal sin. So there's Our Lady also of Fatima is telling us how so many souls are falling into hell like snowflakes. And so we've got so many people in the world that are going into hell. So there's an urgent call that we care about our neighbor because we're a human family. And so in my personal daily holy hours, there's usually a conversation I have with God about how urgent things are and how I beg him that I can get it, that I can get the message that he wants me to know from him and into my heart and that he uses me as his priest to help stop sinners falling into hell like snowflakes and to save souls and that the revolutionary men, that they can be converted. Like St. Peter was one of the first who revolted against Jesus by denying him three times. And Jesus looked upon him with his face. And as it says in the scriptures, Peter went out weeping. And so if we have this fervor that our Lord Jesus has in his sacred heart, he can use us to wound the revolutionary men to convert them and to to cause a civil war in in the camp of the enemy so they'll, they'll fall. So every day that goes by, it seems like the world's getting more and more engulfed in this revolution. But yet again, God's the one that is cursing us with the revolutionary men. And it's through the devotion to the holy face that he's showed us a clear way of how to get out from underneath this revolution and to have a triumph of the Immaculate Heart and to have a triumph of the Catholic Church. I'm going to read another quote. You brought up part of it earlier, but there's a little more to it that I wanted to just add in. And um, so it's, uh, quote, today's idolatry is worse than the Old Testament idolatry because the pagans of old did not know Christ. Neo-pagans know Christ and still reject him. The damage our human family causes by offending the Godhead needs to be repaired. Our Lord calls repairers to resolve the problem of idolatry so that good pagans and informed pagans convert. Reparation to the holy face of Jesus is the answer to idolatry. Just to give the importance of this devotion when it when it was first approved, there was even an entire order of priests in France dedicated to the holy face. Can you share the story of what became of them? Yes. So, Venerable Leo Pont had his relic in his drawing room where he was a lawyer in Tours, France. And when he died, the archbishop converted his drawing room into a chapel, a public chapel. And there were so many people sending in letters of getting the oil from Venerable Leo Pont and letters of cures that the archbishop set the dean of the chapter of canons, secular canons of Tours, to be uh, Father Jean, Father Hanvier, to, to be the one who would, so to speak, take the place of Venerable Leo de Pont. But the volume was so high, and there was such a spiritual need, that the bishop actually instituted 
a group of priests called Priests of the Holy Face. Mm. And I think they were mostly made up of Das and clergy that were the secular canons that would chant the divine office at the cathedral and that were the ones responsible for the pontifical ceremonies. So they began to exist. They, be, they, re, they wrote books. They wrote, they took over the administration of this. And when the Arch Confraternity was erected in 1885, they were like a religious community, but there were still the Austin priests, which I find very fascinating. Mm -hmm. But then I haven't been able to have my questions answered at the center for the Arch Confraternity and Tours. My question is, these priests no longer exist. What was the narrative of their demise? So I haven't gotten to the bottom of that yet. Yeah, we we just know they they no longer they no longer exist and they're no longer practicing that devotion. We know the enemy attacks efficacious devotions. So <laughs> um, early on in the book, you talk about communism, and then later you devote an entire chapter on the subject. And so, just talk about why you point to this political system as a focal point for the devotion to the Holy Face. Sure, because one of the revelations that Jesus gave to Sister Mary St. Peter, he calls out one of the revolutionary groups, communists. And this was happening concurrently when the Communist Manifesto was made public, being made public by Karl Marx. And one of the main things that this revolution and these communists, and they can be called different names, just as long as we remember them as a revolution. They're very good with propaganda, and they're very good with making us Catholics hate ourselves. They make us, they're very good about making us hate the history of our church, about apologizing constantly when there's no need to have apologies for the cat, the, some of the greatest Catholics that live. There's also this hatred that we have of the sacred liturgies that we used to, to celebrate all over the world until 1965. So this propaganda machine is being used very cleverly against the people of God in the Catholic Church. And that's what these revolutions are good at. And God's letting them win because there's nobody shouting out like St. Michael did against the revolution against God. Who was like unto God? So that's what I think this devotion is. David is helping us with is to see some good Catholics that really want to be generous and to return goodness for the blasphemy that the world is is basically vomiting against God. Yeah, and your book is filled with kinds of battle cries and pointing us to be willing to fight these spiritual battles for and with our Lord. And I think just as you were mentioning that, St. Veronica came to mind. Like the fact that Jesus left his face on her veil, just talk about how significant that was for her to have even stepped out into the middle of Christ's walk to Calvary. It's a beautiful story. I like how Cardinal Baronius, uh, protege of St. Philip Neri, great historian, writes how she had a, a, an extra linen on her arm and she broke through the mob of the Roman soldiers to console the face of Jesus. Now, these soldiers didn't know what was going on. They were stunned. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to react. So she wasn't just hit on the face right away. She was given that moment to console the face of Jesus and by doing that, Jesus left his imprint. As we know now, the Vela Veronica that is housed in St. Peter's Basilica. And so Jesus told Sister Mary St. Peter, oh, how there would, I wish there would be Veronicas who would break through the mob to console my face. So one of my, or a couple of my thoughts on that is, is how we need Veronicas to break through the mob that's trying to lock down our churches that happened a few years ago, how we need Veronica's to break through the divine liturgies that the, the mob is trying to prevent us from having a true adoration of God 
You know, when we, David, when we approach God, we should give him the greatest reverence possible because he's God and he's good. And for that reason alone, we shouldn't have any kind of lackadaisical way of worshiping him. So we need Veronica's to break through the mobs in our current day and modern day world, the revolution, so that we can console his face too. Because then we will get a great reward based upon the effort that we have breaking through this mob. And we want to pray that this mob converts. We don't want the death of the sinner, but we want his conversion. We want the conversion of this mob to come into Christianity. So they can be saved. That's right. Like many visionaries, Sister Mary of St. Peter took on a world of suffering because it wasn't like every all of her revelations were being accepted at the moment that they were happening. And what what have you learned about her life or what more do you know about her life? Yeah, as I read, she suffered at a young age many physical sufferings. And she also suffered a bit from misunderstandings with her superiors. But David, this goes hand in hand with all the, the great religious saints like St. Teresa of Avila, the great reformer of the Carmelites. She had like three years of constant suffering and she almost died and she was in a, a coma for so long. So Sister Mary St. Peter is just very much alike of these religious that suffered yet she has not been canonized and her process has gone forward, but it has stopped. And I, I want to get at the bottom of that, but towards the end of her life, she suffered from a throat cancer. And it's so fitting because she was making reparation for blasphemy. Well, where does blasphemy come? It comes from our throats. It's uttered through our mouths and our throats. And I think I read even that while she was suffering this cancer, a wasp or a bee came into her mouth or her throat and stung her. Wow. So it's remarkable how much physical suffering she went through. So I hope, David, that as more recognition comes through this book that I wrote and through other people that are becoming apostles today of the holy face of Jesus, as this arch confraternity is known, I, I hope that her cause for canonization gets picked up again and goes forward. And I think if we were to get a million people they were fired up about this. I think that it would be very much uh, probable this cause is going to go forward again. So hopefully she'll be raised to the altar. Can you talk a little bit about, you've mentioned Fatima, but can you, you, you do mention how much Tours France is connected to Fatima and Trefontane in terms of similar dates, events, what Our Lady is telling us in those places. Can you just give a, a, like a brief overview of how those are so uh, connected to all of this. Yeah, the date, May the 13th, is the big connector. So we know Our Lady of Fatima is May the 13th, when that's Our Lady started to talk to the children. Now, May 13th was a big day when one of the popes converted the Pantheon into a church. And this was where the relics of the saints were put. So this is where All Saints was developed. And also the Vela Veronica was put in there for about three centuries. Wow. And on May the 13th, the Vela will be taken out to, in a way, to be a battle cry against the paganism in the world. And then Trey Fontaine, the three founts where St. Paul was beheaded, the legend is, which means the, the, the letter or the story, the legend, so it's the truth, where his head bounced, there were three fountains. So Our Lady began to appear there in the 1940s and 50s. And in that message, she talked about how May the 13th was an important day. And I can't remember the specifics of it, but that message of Our Lady of Revelation um, talked about how in the future, in decades to come, there would be such little charity in the world. And that would, would be symbolized by a crumpled up cassock that was at the base of her feet where she was appearing. She said, that's the symbol of a lack of charity in the church in the future. Hmm. So May the 13th is a very important day for these three revelations. 
There are also many important historic figures who are the apostles of this devotion when it was popular. Can you just talk about some of these figures who who practiced this devotion? Sure. So St. Dismas, the good thief, he's the counterpart to Veronica. So Veronica's for, our, for the women, and then Dismas is for men in this devotion because he cried out against the blasphemy when Jesus was dying on the cross. Then we have a saint that's very little known. Her name is St. Veronica of Giuliani in Italy. She went to hell for, you know, to suffer a, a while while she was living. And she told people that the instruments of the passion would be engraved on her heart. And so after she died, they, they looked at her heart and there were the implements, the nails and the crown of thorns, et cetera, on her heart. And the bishop said to this miracle, there's a lot that's going to be learned and revealed from this hmm. event, miracle event, miraculous event. Then we have St. Therese of Lisieux, who is a great devotee of the Holy Face, and very few people know about that, because she read the, the biography of Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre and adopted a lot of her life based upon the autobiography and the revelations about the Holy Face. And that's why the second part of her name is and of the Holy Face. So we have our Archbishop Perch, the third bishop, Archbishop of New Orleans. He was the first bishop to take the confraternity into the new, the new world. So the first confraternity of the Holy Face in the New World was in New Orleans, and he wrote a circular letter for, for Lent how this devotion to the Holy Face needs to be something important alongside with devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. And I think he lived around tours before he moved to the United States, and he went back to visit this place where Venerable Leo de Pont was. Uh, Leo de Pont had a crystal lamp beside his copy of the of the devotion or he had a copy of the holy face and there were many miracles from that lamp weren't there or yes there were six thousand certified miracles david that's <laughs> thaumaturgist that's a great amount and they're certified meaning that physical doctors sign affidavits that these miracles were beyond physical ep- explanation so right there we have something that God did that shows us this devotion has a great future ahead of it. And when I was in, I, I say this all the time when I'm interviewed, when I was investments before I became a seminarian, I had to look at companies that were going to be future stars. And this devotion is a future star just based on that alone. Mm-hmm. So lamp was a lamp of olive oil and he burned it in front of the holy face day and night and he anointed people with this oil and that's where the miracles occurred in front of the holy face oil lamp yeah it's it's incredible and your passion about the subject is just uh, very inspiring and you talk about saving society through praying this devotion and that requires not only devotion but also faith as many people right now who call themselves Catholics are really lukewarm. And so, you know, how do we use mystical combat in this spiritual battle? This is the greatest question you ask. And in fact, I signed a contract with Chan to write another book. And it's going to be called Consecration, Total Consecration to the Holy Face. And it's basically, how do we grow in union with God? So how do we go through the the three levels of the spiritual life? So that's just it. This devotion not only is going, can help us save society, but it can help each particular soul have a great union with God. And, And when this happens, a great charity comes into the soul. And we know St. Paul talks about after this life, faith and hope are no longer there, but charity remaineth. And charity is basically the currency of God. Charity means love of God and neighbor and and oneself. 
And the degree that we love God and neighbor and ourselves will be the degree of glory, please God, in heaven. And there's different degrees of glories in heaven based upon the amount of charity that we have. So this devotion can really help people to jumpstart them, to leap them into a life of union with God. So, and that's just it. As I get deeper into this devotion, I see the end game is we're supposed to see God face to face. So this devotion is a practice of doing that right now. We can start living heaven on earth in our souls right now and have that constant conversation with God through the eyes of faith. Hopefully Sunday, we'll see them through the eyes of charity because we'll see him really as he is face to face with an intellectual vision, which is greater than we can see ourselves with our own eyes. Yeah, that is uh, that is such a beautiful thought because anyone who's contemplated the beatific vision, we're really born for that. We're baptized for that. That's what our life here is supposed to be about. And this devotion prepares us for that moment. Um, should should we or should we arrive? <laughs> but uh, there's a there's you talk about Pius the Ninth's papacy, um, and it seems like that is also mirroring a lot of what we're seeing today. I mean, it, it almost feels like some of his writings as Pope were really written for this time, for this day and age. That uh, can you can you just talk about that a, a bit? Uh, you know how revolutionary men were coming into the dialogue even then? Yes, he was dealing with the Freemasons and we're still dealing with them in the Vatican, but they're very good about being quiet. But they were, and you know, we, we've we got um, St. Maximilian Kolbe, when he was a Franciscan, he was being formed in Rome. He also saw the Freemasons out making parades against the Catholic Church. So going back to Blessed Pius IX, he said reparation is destined to save society. And I think he's a prophet there because reparation is one of the, the four ends of sacrifice. The other ones are adoration, petition, and thanksgiving. Well, reparation is to restore the relationship between our human family and with God. And so he was... His life was in jeopardy because this revolution against the papal states was occurring during his papacy. So he escaped on his own volition into Gaeta and he commanded that the churches of Rome would, would do public um, prayers and to make reparation for what was happening to the Church of Christ. And that's where this, this interconnected with what he did because the canons at St. Peter's Basilica, put out the veil of Veronica and a miracle happened. And the veil began to show itself boldly again because it was faded completely. You can't see the features of the face of Christ on the veil right now. And the artist would draw this miracle and they engraved it and sent it all over Europe. And that's where Venerable Leonard Pont got a copy that was touched to this veil. So, Blessed Pius the Ninth. He did so much for this devotion. We quote him about that because he was seeing the very beginning of the revolution. And, and now we see how the church has been decimated since then, how little she's getting. So he predicted that this devotion was destined to save society. And I think that he's a pope that was speaking in the, in the mouth of Peter, you know, the vicar of Christ. Jesus Christ made him the vicar to speak to us how to save ourselves then and now. His voice goes over the centuries, literally the decades. The devotion isn't that complicated. Uh, it doesn't call on um, Christians to or people who pray regularly to add that much to their daily prayer, really. I know you've got a forthcoming book, but do you want to give a hint towards uh, the, just the beauty and simplicity of, of this devotion when it comes to actually practicing the devotion. Yeah, as I learn more and more about this devotion, I just see it as enhancing the spiritual life that 
Catholics are already living. And it also helps them to bring it to another level. So it's just like anybody that has the, the total consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary, once they do that, it's like a new stage of the, the prayer life happens in the soul. Well, I think when people get enrolled in the Holy Face, a whole new level comes and they don't have to add a whole lot to their spiritual life, maybe one minute a day and about one hour a month at a monthly meeting. And I think that it helps us to see how precious a relic we have of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, especially in the Latin Rite, the Trinitine Mass. It helps us to appreciate the Rosary more deeply because when we contemplate the mysteries, we focus on the face of the characters, especially Jesus and Mary and Joseph in there. And so it is such a simple devotion. And that's perfection because God is simple. He's one, true, beautiful, and simple. So devotions help us to be tender towards certain aspects of the church or of God. And that's what this devotion does. It helps us to be very tender towards the face of our Lord and God. And I'll leave you with this on this question. The Psalms are, are just, they're rippled with the face of God. And when I pray the Psalms daily, this devotion has helped me to really pick up and to be more attentive to the holy face in the scriptures. Father Lawrence Carney, author of The Secret of the Holy Face. That's who I've been speaking with today. Thank you so much for allowing your heart to be moved and to bring this volume to Catholics so that we can increase our devotion and and uh, do our part spiritually in the battle and in these times that we're living in. David, it's been an honor to be able to spread my love of our Lord and God, and I appreciate the work you're doing, too, to extend His kingdom. Check us out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, our website, thefocusingway.com.